Welcome, everybody. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Supply and Demand, Analyzing the Labor Market for Jewish Educators. This is the third and final webinar in our three-part series that we have hosted on support by CASG, the Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education on Career Trajectories of Jewish Educators, Key finding for the funding, Findings for the Funding Community. We'll again today have the opportunity for a high-level presentation of the key findings and a facilitated discussion um, about the unique questions, concerns, and opportunities of the funding community that, uh, to translate this research into practice and policy. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by Stacey Turner, who's a Director of Learning and Evaluation at Jim Joseph Foundation, Dr. Ariel Bess, Director of CASG, and Dr. Alex Pompson, Principal Managing Director of Rasa Consulting. I also wanted to take a moment to um, thank the Jim Joseph Foundation and the William Davidson Foundation for being big supporters of this, these programs and of, um, the, of the study and making sure that we have, we have this data and this information um, to help us make the best funding decisions and to understand what's out there. And with that, I wanna introduce Stacy Turner to get us started today. Thank you, Stacy. Sure, thank you, Tamar. Um, I wanna just thank Ariel and Alex for being here today and for Tamar for um, arranging uh, this learning session. Um, I really, I feel like this is a Shehekianu moment. Uh, this is the final session in our learning series through JFN um, and it's been quite a journey. Um, thanks to CASG and your team of experts and to uh, the Rosoff team for your dedication and to JFN and to most importantly to the William Davidson Foundation um, for being partners in this uh, this this amazing work. Um, we began the research in partnership with the William Davidson Foundation to understand more about the career trajectories of Jewish educators. Um, Professionalizing the field of Jewish educators has always been a central pillar of our philanthropy. And we knew that we and the field needed more foundational research to inform our decision making. So, um, as I said, this is the third and final session disseminating those findings to the JFN audience. Um, and I think I can speak for my colleague, Manny. Uh, that we hope you have been and continue to be inspired and curious, inspired by and then curious about uh, what the findings are showing us um, and also the questions that they make us um, ask ourselves. Um, I think uh, as you are listening to these um, findings today, I encourage you to think about, you know, who are the experts um, that guide you through your decision making about your grant making. Um, specifically from today's findings, you know, what are you surprised about? Um, what questions do you have um, as you as you think about what's being presented today? And, and we'll have an opportunity to discuss those at the end um, and then hopefully um, even more um, as in the con continuing months. Um, as you know, funder to funder, as we think about what to do um, as a result of these findings. Um, so um, I'm going to pass it over to the professionals. Uh, we'll offer a 25-minute presentation, and questions are welcome in the chat. Tomorrow we'll monitor the chat and we'll interrupt the presentation with clarifying questions, but we'll hold kind of the big discussion questions for the end. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it to Ariel and Alex. Thank you so much, Stacey. Hi. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Ariel Levitas. I'm the Managing Director at CASG, the Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education. We're housed at George Washington University, and our mission is to improve the quality of knowledge that can guide Jewish education practice and policy. Uh, and Tamar, if you're ready, you can go ahead and, and put those slides up. Uh, and I'm we're thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Alex Ponson from Rosov Consulting. Um, and uh, we are going to be 
uh, sharing with you some key findings from the recent CASG career trajectory study as it relates specifically to the labor market for Jewish educators. And again, I would just want to acknowledge the study was funded by generous grants from the William Davidson Foundation and the Jim Joseph Foundation. And it is so wonderful to have Stacey Turner with us serving as host of this program. And I think Manny uh, maybe will share a few words as well later. Uh, we can go to the next slide. slide. Thanks. Okay, so I do wanna just take one minute to give a balcony view of the larger study. And as a reminder, you can find the reports and briefs um, and a little more forthcoming still um, on our website. And I'll drop a link to that uh, in just a couple of minutes. But very briefly, the CASG Career Trajectory Study is a larger scale, multi-strand program of research. It was designed through a signature process at CASG where we bring together researchers, practitioners, funders, and other stakeholders in Jewish education uh, to generate a set of pressing questions for which um, more knowledge could reasonably lead to the capacity to make better decisions and meet our ultimate goal of fueling improvements in Jewish education. So the puzzle pieces that you see here summarize the key questions that animated uh, our investigation in each of the strands. And today we're gonna focus on that bottom left quadrant that we call mapping the market. Uh, next slide. So, uh, yeah, great. So the study has a broad view of who a Jewish educator is and where they might work. I think probably most of us here have an appreciation for the fact that Jewish education happens in many kinds of places. It can be inside outdoors, it can happen in person, it can happen online. Um, and so for the purposes of this study, we looked at five sectors and I'm gonna move a little quickly through this, but you can learn more about the inclusion and exclusion criteria and how we framed uh, the various sectors in the methodology section of the reports. Next slide. Okay. So mapping the market looks at the labor market for Jewish education in the United States. And we're analyzing both the supply side and the demand side data to understand what it is employers look for in Jewish educators and how pre-service and professional development programs prepare educators to meet the needs of learners and the communities that they serve. So for those of you who may have joined us for uh, the last couple of sessions, you may remember that we described really the Jewish education workforce, um, the people who, who make up that workforce and issues pertaining to their recruitment, retention and development. So today we're gonna look a little bit beyond the educators themselves to a larger set of institutional dynamics in which their careers take shape. So the labor market, right, is a context um, that through larger patterns of contraction and expansion create um, currents that could be subtle, not so subtle, that can shift and direct career pathways and also mold the profession itself. So our presentation today is a small bite. And uh, again, it's a summary of much more extensive data and findings that you can find in the full mapping the market report. So again, we're looking at supply side and de demand side dynamics and then how they align and interact. And by supply side here, uh, we mean the programs and the institutions that prepare or support Jewish educators and by demand side, uh, we mean the institutions that employ Jewish educators. Um, and you can see uh, a little summative, summative graphic of the data collection process. Um, uh, and I just wanna add, so that studies in general education have shown that the teacher labor market can be responsive to market conditions and targeted interventions. There are things one can do to respond to shortages, um, to produce educator candidates that fill high demand needs. Um, and so this study is designed to help us understand some of the market forces at work in our own Jewish education ecosystem, which may allow for identifying possible points uh, of intervention as well. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so we're actually going to return to this infographic later in the presentation. Alex is going to talk about it more in light of um, the challenges faced um, in recruitment and retention uh, in, in, in our COVID world. But I just want to use it now to very briefly acknowledge that even as we're going to be talking about the labor market for Jewish educators, one finding of the study is that we might be better served by conceptualizing this as markets, plural. Um, and that um, comports also with the general education uh, market as well. You probably have all heard or encountered some news story that in the United States overall, we're facing what we call a teacher shortage. Um, and we tend to talk about it sometimes as a blanket teacher shortage, but that kind of contraction or tightness in pipelines, the staffing challenges are actually felt more acutely in certain types of schools. And for certain types of teaching or staffing positions, there, there is variability. And that's true also in the Jewish education labor market as well, right? Conditions vary from sector to sector uh, across venue types. There is variability. And so we're gonna come back to this later. Okay, next slide. Thank you so much, Tamar. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about supply side before I pass it over to Alex. Um, so first of all, I think it's hard to imagine a Jewish education that is positioned to meet its own goals for success, however we might uh, define those goals without educators who are supported to do their work well. Uh, and that support takes multiple forms, right? It's compensation packages, it's the organization of workplaces, but it's also in the institutional structures that we provide for professional learning that is both pre-service, that's before educators start their formal work, and also in-service. So that's supporting professional development for educators who already are employed. So in looking at what we call the supply side dynamics, we were asking what are the programs that are training today and tomorrow's educators, Jewish educators, um, what markets do these programs serve and what do they imagine are the roles that educators are going to fill? Um, and I want to acknowledge that we ask a lot of educators and what we need from our Jewish education workforce is only increasing. So we have right the content knowledge, we have the pedagogic capacities. We also we want them to engage and inspire. We, we need them to work on multiple platforms, right? Including facility with emerging technology. Uh, we need them to navigate demanding health protocols. We need them, you know, increasingly to be attuned to the learner mental health and well being. And we also need them, we're, we're, we're more and more aware, to support a changing and more diverse population of American Jews, right? So, how are we preparing Jewish educators? to respond to those multiple needs. Even the most talented individually can't just naturally know how to, how to do all those things or do them well, right? So on the one hand, right, we have much more need. We're asking more and more from our educators. And then also concurrently, you know, we find that because of high demand to fill these roles and some other trends, there are few formal expectations for preparation to work in Jewish educational settings. And we saw this in one of our earlier webinars with JFN, if you attended that, right? We, we reported that accidental entry in Jewish education is the number one way people tell us they entered the field, right? The, the most uh, frequently reported pathway in is I had a job opportunity and decided to take it. And that means that many bypass the supply side institutions that may have prepared them, right? So what does it mean that people are entering the field having bypassed formal pre-service educational programs? We could go to the next slide. So research in general K through 12 education has shown that the most important school-based factor in student outcomes are the teachers themselves. Teachers matter and how we structure teaching as a profession how we support teachers' professional growth, their ongoing continued development, that all matters for learner outcomes. And research in general education suggests that teachers who are prepared um, in formal traditional training programs, they stay in their schools and in the profession longer. 
So improved retention is one important marker for teacher quality and for improved student outcomes. And we also see that there are particular components of formal pre-service professional learning that are linked to higher quality, more effective teachers. Um, and this includes um, supervised student teaching, uh, uh, working with a high quality mentor teacher. So these, these practicum experiences are very important and are statistically linked to more effective teachers. And this kind of field work is almost always a feature of formal pre-service programs. Um, but these programs, even as they're based in some promising research evidence, uh, seem to be valued less and less in the Jewish education market. Okay, next slide. So this tell, okay, so this is looking at what employers tell us they're looking for in educators that they hire and what are the, on the left, the most important uh, capacities and on the right, the least important capacities. So we have a, an interesting dynamic in the Jewish education labor market, whereby the professional experiences that are associated with teacher retention and quality, at least in the general K through 12 literature, are not particularly valued in the market for Jewish educators. So we are on the supply side producing a modest number of credential Jewish educators, but the degree is often not rewarded in the marketplace. It's not what employers in many sectors tell us they're looking for. So broadly conceived, Jewish education is a field essentially that has no regulated entry. There are no requirements in most sectors for any degree degree, licensure, certificate, that there can be exceptions um, in day schools and in early childhood, but just sort of broadly looking at the field, right? We have a market ecosystem um, in which many of our educators are not benefiting from these kind of intensive, coherently designed, evidence-based pre-service or early service opportunities. Um, and it absolutely does not mean that those capacities on the left side, um, those more relational dispositional qualities don't matter, right? Relationships, trust, respect, absolutely have to be the foundation of any teacher learner relationship. They're the bedrock of um, educators' responsibilities to their learners, but you know, is there a place for content knowledge, pedagogic content knowledge in, in this market? Uh, next slide. So here are some quotes from our supply side providers that give some insight into how market forces may depress investment in a formal degree or credential. Um, the knowledge and know-how that is part of an education degree certificate uh, is not generally valued in the marketplace. And so it's a real cost then to any potential student, right? There's the cost of tuition and also the opportunity cost if you can just go out and get a job right away without necessarily much gain in the marketplace. So I'm not gonna read these out loud, but I'll just give, I'll just pause for like a few seconds just so you can kind of scan these comments. Um, okay, and then the next slide. Okay, and then here we're hearing from that demand slot side, right, from the employers. And I do think that there, we can see a lack of alignment there, right? The employers are not looking for educators with degrees. Um, they have critiques uh, sometimes of the programs, they're not affordable or accessible, um, or that they may not be preparing educators for the context in which Jewish education happens. But um, increasingly, um, those evidence-based forms of preparation of high quality teachers who are committed to their institutions and to the field um, are, are not valued in a marketplace, giving a little incentive for people to seek out these opportunities. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Alex, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about the demand side. Thank you, uh, Ariel. As Ariel said, I'm gonna focus on what we've learned from folks who employ Jewish educators about how they see uh, the landscape, how they see the marketplace. And if we can just move on to the next slide. Uh, you've seen this before. This was really 
this is a, a, a summative picture of what we learned more than a year ago now, 14 or 16 months ago from those we interviewed and surveyed about their hiring, their recruitment and their development of Jewish educators. Now, as part of our work with Kashi, we had an opportunity um, just four months ago, this past summer, to go back to as many of those people that we previously spoke with to get a better sense of how, how is the marketplace looking today? Uh, and at that point, it was more about a year and a half into the pandemic. And I'm gonna simplify here, but the simplification hopefully conveys to you uh, what, what's happening out there. And then we'll dig into some specifics is that if you look at that bottom row there with each bar, each blue bar indicating a level of difficulty in pretty much every venue there, you should be adding at least another bar and maybe two bars. The overall situation is that much more challenging today than it was a year ago when we first gathered the data. And in the next month or so, we will release an updated report about the marketplace um, as impacted by, by COVID. Really looking at this one uh, uh, graphic, I would say the one sector that where you may not want to put a full additional bar might be the day school sector, a sector that has seen an increase in enrollment among uh, its clients, as it were. And uh, typically heads of schools have conveyed to us in the eight communi communities where we originally conducted the research and where we returned a year later, that they are still able to find, it, it is no, 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 no harder today finding uh, folks for those positions than it was uh, a year ago. That's not the case in pretty much all of the other sectors here. So what I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is just convey to you some of the, the big picture impressions we gained returning to people uh, a year after we originally spoke to them. And what we're able to do here is, is, is get us fresh a view of the demand side of the marketplace uh, as possible. So if we can go to the next uh, slide. Alex, could I just interrupt? This This previous slide was a little confusing to me when I first saw it. Would you mind just taking us through, maybe using CAMP as an example, what each of, it sure. has a big roster size. It, 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 could With you pleasure. just take us through that? Yeah, right. We, we basically concluded that the recruitment challenge in any single venue is a consequence of the interaction between three factors. One of which is uh, how many people do you need to, how many positions do you need to fill at any given time? That's the roster size. So at camp, because of the level of turnover, and we'll get to that uh, in a moment, but even without the level of turnover, camps need to hire a lot of folks doing Jewish education every summer. So we, uh, you see three bars there because there are a lot of Jewish educators that camps need to hire compared to the early childhood sector where typically any, uh, any single early childhood center doesn't hire very many Jewish educators. Turnover at camp is very high, particularly frontline staff, non-specialist staff, non-senior staff. Um, many of them stay for one summer, uh, most of them, stay for uh, two summers or less. So there's a lot of turnover there that contributes to the staffing challenge. However, in the camping sector, there was, at least until a year ago, a deep pool from which the, the employers could draw in order to hire staff. So overall, when they talk about the extent of their challenge, that's a sector where, which was not experiencing so much difficulty pre-COVID, right? And so you see the summative bar at the bottom there, suggesting that that's actually one of the easier sectors to fill. Stacey, does that, that helps? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, fantastic. Having said all of that about camp, I'll just preview and say that the talent pool uh, and the challenge, the talent pool shrunk this past summer and the challenge became that much more acute and people are quite pessimistic about recruitment into camp going forward, recruitment of educators as opposed to recruitment of campers. We'll get to that. 
in a moment. So if we can go to the next slide. So we really identify kind of four phenomena that seem to be very strongly uh, sh um, shaped by COVID. The first you could say is, is that the phenomenon popularly known as the, the great resignation. Like Jewish education is not, uh, it does not exist in a vacuum. And uh, we're able to say that, and what we have found is that many people have been close to retirement, pulled the trigger over the past 18 months. Uh, these people may have stayed on for some years, but the deep difficulties and the intense changes in instruction, whatever the sector and the general stress and tension that most of those people have experienced has condensed the time in which people have been leaving the field entirely. So many venues, and I think outstanding in this respect is the early childhood se uh, sector, are witnessing a kind of generational turnover that is really making uh, recruitment particularly challenging. Um, and you know, at the same time, senior leadership across the venues are experiencing burnout. We're seeing that in day school, congregational schools, camp heads are retiring or quitting their jobs at unusually higher, higher rates. So all told, like it's likely that these ripple effects, will be, there will be ripple effects from these departures that will be felt on lower level staffing and hiring and in particular in terms of training, socialization and supervision of younger and newer employees. And we have a, a quotation here from a camp director reflecting all of this. The way the camps folks talked about the last summer was this was our most ch challenging summer ever. They don't mean it as the most difficult, the, 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 the most problematic summer, their worst summer. It was simply challenging because of the, the co coincidence of so many factors that related to uh, hiring and uh, maintaining and supervising staff. Okay, on, on to the next slide, if possible. Um, what else are we seeing across the sectors? Okay, if you want to go to the next slide, here we go. Without any question, uh, a phenomenon, you know, the, a, a mental health epidemic that it really is uh, affect, affecting and afflicting everybody. Mental health issues are everywhere. Campers and students, parents, staff, and staff of all levels of ages and senior leadership have been living in a scary and chaotic world for quite a while now. And it's a politically polarized world as well. And that complicates how people handle the challenges of the past two years. To sum it up, there are burnt out directors leading traumatized staff trying to help traumatize children whose parents have been at the end of their own ropes for a year or more. That's hard. And this is a cry that resounded in every sector and every venue. Um, and a good many do not have the wherewithal to adequately respond uh, to that situation, which is why so many folks, as you can see in the quotation, told us that um, professional development in relation to mental health and addressing mental health issues in their clients and in their uh, staff is really a central issue in terms of their, uh, their needs. Okay, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Okay, all of this is taking place while people observe what they see as a diminishing pipeline. In many ways, we've always known that Jewish education was kind of the ever expiring profession. People always have talked about a crisis, a looming crisis. It's on the horizon. In many ways, we could say that today the horizon is just outside our windows. And, um, and this is a consequence of the intersection of a broader, of broader societal phenomena that challenge Jewish educations, um, at Jewish educators, I should say, and Jewish organizations. They're not unique. Jewish organizations are competing in a larger labor market and not just with one another. And so like in all the sectors and venues we explored, the, the leaders acknowledged that pay is simply too low for their organizations to be competitive. And particularly that part-time work is no longer sufficiently desirable for the people they seek to recruit. We heard from one early childhood uh, employer who told us, they found it hard to bring staff back when somebody noticed that across the across the street at Target, you could earn $5.50 more an hour than you were earning 
in the early childhood sector. This has been a long running concern in early childhood and congregational education, and it is particularly acute today. Um, in our conversation, we also heard about this phenomenon from day school heads who've relied heavily on teaching assistants and substitutes during COVID. And uh, as I've already mentioned, it's a growing concern for those looking to hire camp counselors, both in the day and overnight camps, right? The disruption caused by two unusual summers in the camping industry has accelerated the questioning of long-standing assumptions about camps' capacities to attract talent. So who's coming into the marketplace? There are fewer folks coming into the marketplace and real concern about um, the stream uh, turning into a dribble and, and, and drying up altogether. Um, so concerns about the pipeline. So lastly, the last phenomenon, which is um, in, some, in, in some ways a, a positive, um, is you know, the sense that there has been an increase in technological literacy over the last 18 months that today is seen as a resource that could be harnessed for good even when most programs are back in person. Now, on the one hand, educational providers are still strongly interested in minimizing screen time and maximizing in-person connection, right? There's no, everybody appreciates that relational dimensions of education are, you know, have been compromised by Zoom school and, and people wanna go back to uh, the face-to-face, -face, right? Um, what's new is the appreciation of, you could say the infrastructural and supplemental role technology can play for educational organizations, right? Technology's collateral benefits, such as virtual staff meetings, virtual parent meetings, and remote one-on-one -on -one small group Hebrew instruction. This is one place where what has historically been one of the most challenging parts of the sectors of the marketplace actually has seen new opportunity and a new supply. A number of organizations transitioned to the delivery of remote Hebrew instruction that enabled them to expand their reach in terms of who they were recruiting. And a good many of them uh, are, are saying they don't wanna go back or they are not going back, particularly in the congregational school, supplementary school sector, where people have found that to be an extremely effective way of bringing in staff to serve as Hebrew uh, uh, educators. And that, that really constitutes a, an important um, uh, development. So the last thing to say here, when I go on to the, uh, the last slide is really, um, you know, our finding that as we said previously uh, in, in the full report, mapping the market report and, and in, in various supplements to it, uh, and initially a year ago, and, and now most recently is what's so striking about uh, the world of Jewish education is despite those cross-cutting themes that I've discussed, um, this is still a terrifically uneven landscape. And um, the landscape has become more uneven over the course of COVID. There are real cultural differences between different regions in the United States. And these have become increasingly manifest during the course of uh, the pandemic in terms of how organizations have, uh, how governments and private bodies have responded uh, to the pandemic. So, you know, the difficult decisions facing directors and heads, for example, around vaccination and masking requirements and the patchwork of municipal, state and federal policies around safety measures, right? Means that leadership in different places confront widely varying pressures and stresses. And so if there were differences before within this larger marketplace, there are probably even more differences today. It is a challenging moment in terms of the landscape of uh, and the marketplace uh, for Jewish educators. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Uh, lots to process. Um, I think we are going to open it up to Q and A, um, and I and I believe Tamar is going to bring everybody back into uh, bring the audience in to the as panelists. But I'm not sure. But in the meantime, uh, while while we're uh, transitioning, um, Alex, I just wanted to ask you a question that came up 
as I was reading the report, and I just thought it might be helpful um, for other people to, to understand. Um, the Mapping the Marketplace specifically highlights certain professional development programs in the narrative, and I, I was curious about why those programs and why the why the researchers chose to, to highlight them as opposed to others. And I just wondered if you could give a little bit of background on that. Sure. Right, so we were very much led by the market um, in interviews and surveys with employers. We, we asked them about who are the providers they are turning to uh, who help them find staff and grow staff. Um, uh, that was certainly a, uh, uh, a, a starting place uh, for us. Um, we were very much uh, interested in people who were preparing frontline staff as well. We weren't looking at organizations that either prepare or provide professional development or Jewish educational leaders, senior staff uh, in, in organizations. Um, and, and then finally, there was a kind of snowballing method methodology here. As we started to talk to people, we, we, we asked them about who their competitors were, right? Who else is in this field? So we were really trying to be as responsive as possible to what the market or you know what the market was telling us uh, constitutes the supply side uh, of the landscape. And that's really how we came to identify uh, those various people. Great, thank you. Um, and then as we're all coming back on, Rachel and Mark have both posted questions that um, are places I want to go, but um, I do want the audience to hear from Ariel about how the field is responding um, to this research a little bit and how they've been engaging with, with Kazji and with Rosoff um, about the findings. Sure. So I'll say that it, it, you know, just like we talked about the variability in the market you know, people in different sectors and um, professionals and leaders in di different sectors are kind of um, resonating um, with, you know, various findings. So I see this here uh, from Prisma and, um, and and maybe at some point he'll, he'll talk a little bit about um, some of what we've been doing. But I'll, just to give two examples. Um, so ADCA, which is, um, the Association of Directors of Central Agencies. So those are people who will lead the BJEs um, or sometimes they're embedded in federations, but they're responsible for Jewish education in um, 30 different metropolitan areas in the US. They've identified recruitment as uh, the most pressing issue that they share um, that would benefit from more collaboration. Um, so we've um, together, uh, you know, gone through the research findings, and we're actually going through a facilitated process. We're meeting again tomorrow. Now we're going to be looking at um, research evidence around interventions for um, uh, improved retention and bringing in promising candidates in Jewish education, and talking also about some of their own local efforts and experiments in that arena towards um, making a set of recommendations for the field um, that, that they're driving. And I'll, just the other example I'll give is we're also right now um, convening what we're kind of loosely calling the universe of professional development providers, which had no umbrella organization um, under which they operated, no sort of champion, nobody setting professional guidelines for what that work looks like to begin to come together and test um, to want to engage with the research, which um, people reached out to Kazji and said, wow, there are a lot of implications for our work as PD providers and we need some kind of venue in which to engage um, in understanding that and thinking about what's next. Um, so we'll be um, convening probably representatives from about 20 different professional development um, providing programs across the US um, in January. Uh, and I think it's it's maybe one of the first times that they've all come together to engage um, with the study findings and think about what it means for their work and meeting their own goals. So those are just a couple examples. Great, thank you. Something we're very excited about. Um, so Rachel, you posted um, 
about a, a question that really struck me as I as I read the report. Um, and I don't know if uh, if you want to say anything more or just um, hear from Ariel and Alex a, about their ideas. And then I would love to hear from from the rest of the audience about um, their thoughts about this question and what we what we may or may not be able to do about that. Yeah, I, I don't really have more to add. I just like it's mm -hmm. it's obviously a striking piece, right? We we think about kind of many of us are used to thinking about degree granting programs, right, as the primary pre-service way of training uh, teachers, not the only way. And I think we've known for a while that there are uh, great things about them, and then there are also not such great things about them. But to hear kind of right, really from the demand side, right, that there is to some degree a mismatch obviously puts it even more in relief. So I guess, you know, I'm curious about if, if yeah, if people have given some thought to it or and maybe that's the next discussion that needs to be had, right? Meaning have the have the pre-service programs the same way that bureaus or professional development providers in the field, right? Are they beginning to talk about the issue, right? There are quite a number of pre-service programs that could be discussing the issue too, so. So we are also working on getting the pre-service programs together. Um, so that's, a, I think, a great and appreciated point. And I, I want to make room for Alex to respond to some of this, but I, I'll say that one thing that, um, you know, they, that the research team talks about in the report, right, is that there are, there have been institutions that have kind of been responsive to the changing face of American Jewish education and the more kind of diverse venues in which Jewish education happens. And so like not to toot my own <laughs> institutional heart home too much, the horn too much, but you know, at GW, you know, we've had programs for experiential Jewish education, museum education, now Israel education that I think are trying to say like, like what, where is Jewish education happening? What are the needs of the uh, in, of the market, of the employer market today, and how do we design evidence-based, coherent, you know, high-quality programs that that use those facets that we know are going to be so improvement in, important for um, high-quality teachers coming out of these programs, but also respond to the changing dynamics um, of, of, of the field and the needs also. And Alex, I don't know what, you know, I know you probably have a lot to add there. Yeah, I, I just offer an example from a different institution uh, down the street to me uh, at the at, at Pardes that I think has been especially nimble. You think of where they started out very much heavily focused in pre-service pre uh, pre work in day schools, expanded into informal education and most recently into a kind of alternative route into, into education so that people can already be working in the field and be gaining their masters at the same time or some high level of certification. So there is a, a sense of their sensitivity to the marketplace and what it is that people might be looking for. And, and, and I, I really want to underline Rachel and perhaps like declaring my biases here as somebody who's spent a good deal of his career in the pre-service uh, and in-service world I, I think those institutions have critical roles to play. And this is partly going to partly answer the question that Doron uh, posted in terms of correlations here, is that you know we don't have a killer data point we can cite, but there's, there's quite a good deal of evidence in both the preparing for entry work and in the mapping the work market work that individuals who experience what we called uh, enabling opportunities who experienced at an early point in their careers, not necessarily pre-service, but in the er in an early stage in their careers, who experienced investment in cultural capital, social capital, capital, and just general professional resilience, are the folks who are more likely to remain in the field over time, and that such experiences do seem to make a difference, not only to resilience but to the quality of those individuals working in the field. And I mean, I will just add that even in general education, there isn't actually causal research about, like, I just want to be very transparent. There isn't causal research about teacher preparation programs and teacher effectiveness in part because they haven't really randomly assigned people. And then also because generally speaking in teaching, there's actually 
they actually don't have some, they, you don't have people coming into the field with no kind of background at all, which is something a bit exceptional and not necessarily in a good way, right? About what we have in Jewish education. I think we saw one of the quotes was like the alternative to getting your master's in, in a program, in a pre-service program like mine is not having any kind of formal training at all and you're still going to get hired. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's a challenge in terms of kind of finding those like definitive statistics. Um, but there is a, a growing body of evidence about um, the importance of those, those practicums, um, high quality teacher preparation, um, the mentoring of, of early career teachers, but also ongoing throughout the teacher's entire professional career of providing workplace embedded high quality learning for not just um, teacher satisfaction, retention, but also for learner outcomes, um, which is, I guess, at the end of the day, really what we care about and we don't want to lose sight of. Um, I Something that we took from the report is, is, is the idea that you can hone in on these factors like satisfaction and retention. And those are the things that do impact learner outcomes. Um, so I, you know, thank you for that. That was um, something that we really valued in the, in the reporting. Um, you had your hand up and I, before I go on to the next question, I wanna make sure, did you have something to ask about this line of conversation? Yeah, it was a little bit of stream of thought, but one of the things that um, I found in just doing some general research on the challenge of hiring and finding more secular educators is the way that education programs are structured and framed um, and the lack of transferability of skills. I can't remember if we talked about this, Stacey, that like if someone gets trained to go be an educator, the programs aren't structured in a way that that person may say, well, if this ends up not being something I wanna do long-term, I can take these skills and go apply it to these other fields. Um, and whereas if you're, you know, people will go and become a, an attorney or um, get an MBA or even an MSW, like you could go through and these trainings, these training programs present alternative options that if you don't go to what is considered kind of the most direct, obvious path, but education doesn't present that. And so when I read that, I just keep, wondering, um, you know, we're, we're living in a world of increased cost of education and increased cost of living. And if these training programs, secular or Jewishly, um, aren't framing the transferability of skills um, that might be, one might gain from these programs, then it, it may be a, a, a losing battle. And so is that an opportunity for, for change? And would that even make a, a difference? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's lots to say in response to that. Uh, just offer one, one particular thought is that there's no doubt that front loading those kinds of experiences is decidedly unattractive and highly risky, precisely for the reasons that you've said. Is that would, you know, the, the appeal of sinking funds into a preparation program before you've even started work without being absolutely sure that this is going to be right for you is especially risky when, as you say, the, the, the preparation that's often offered is very specific to a particular domain. If those experiences were offered once people had a chance to dip their toe in the water and get a sense of whether this is really for them, then, then the risks are lower. It doesn't mean that the skills are necessarily going to be any more portable, but at least a, a, an individual knows that this is actually going to serve me and enable me to move forward in, in an area that I'm especially interested in. So I think there, uh, you know, a small change in, let's say, the timing of these offerings could could yield uh, significant benefit. I, I think also, Amanda, what, what we're, we're observing out there there are kind of two forces at work uh, and they're contradictory one of which is like increasingly niche 
So to take the example of GW, which started out with a master's in Jewish education, evolved into a master's in informal Jewish education, now has a master's program in Israel education. Like that's an increasingly narrow um, offering, right? But that's an offering that appears to be responding to market forces or and, and at the same time, maybe to, to fund their interest. At the same time, there is another tendency playing out there, which is, and this responds to the question that Mark was asking um, about like um, an emphasis on lack of content, content knowledge, is that there is this phenomenon that ultimately what's most important is the cultivation of, uh, let's call it dispositions and relational skills, right? Less important is the content. What you want is people who can go out there, relate to people and serve as role models for people. And that's a much more portable set of outcomes than training up a specialist in Hebrew or in special education, let's say. So that the, the market is pulling in different directions. Um, does, it doesn't mean that there isn't room for both of those possibilities, but, there, but, it, but it is a bit, of, a bit of a confusing place in that respect. I mean, I'll just say, I've, I've actually never heard the, that the question framed the way that Amanda uh, offered it. And I think it's actually really intriguing. Like, I don't know that we want to be attracting people in the field by, you know, to do these programs by telling them, you know, how they can then, you know, use that in, in other fields. But I'll say as somebody who has a master's in, you know, in teaching and learning, that was, by the way, funded by, by the Avichai Foundation. And I probably never would have done the program were it not funded. Um, and I just want to be transparent about that. But um, using research evidence, right? Um, psychology, uh, U.S. policy, um, like these are like all of these kinds of things are part of what is in a basic curriculum for teacher teaching and learning that could actually be applied in a lot of different kinds of settings. So, um, but I think it's also about appreciating the kind of rigor that these programs actually can bring and how they can actually frame um, a, people who are positioned to respond to the very many needs that we keep piling on and expectations that we keep adding to what um, our educators might, might deliver. It's a really interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say for us, frankly, like it, a, a measure of success is when we invest in educators, do they stay in the field? Um, educators who move on, um, you know, that we've invested in and, and move on to, to public education even is, is seen as a, a measure of not success. Like our board isn't wanting to invest in. So, I mean, that's a really interesting, I too haven't heard of that um, question posed that way. And it's really interesting, like maybe, maybe that shouldn't be a measure of success actually. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any other Thoughts, Manny, you wrote something in them. In I, the, I would say that the, uh, an interesting case here of the Springboard Fellows um, and the kind of metrics used to assess the success of that program. And, you know, um, there was a recognition that not everybody goes, you know, not every fellow is going to remain in the campus space. Um, many move into other uh, commun Jewish communal sectors, and then there are others who go beyond the Jewish community. Um, and you know, question is like, what's a, what's a, what, what counts as success? Is it a, you know, what's your batting average essentially, right? And uh, what's a, what's a reasonable set of expectations? You know, it, it's it's certainly not going to get a hundred percent, but that but there there is a receptiveness there or an expectation that. A, a proportion, maybe two thirds, are going to remain in sector. Uh, the other third is going to go elsewhere, and that elsewhere may be Jewish, but it may not be. I, I just want to offer a, a few thoughts on that. One is <clears throat> that um, considering the percentage of people who are entering Jewish leadership roles from outside of the space, if they're getting early training, Stacy, it would be interesting on a longer term level if they're getting training things to the Jim Joseph Foundation and they're in the field for two or three years and then leave, but then might come back later on, maybe it's too early to determine whether it's success or not success. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would also say, um, 
I, you know, Alex, you, you mentioned Pardes uh, a little earlier in the conversation. Um, I had a conversation with the leadership of Pardes a few years back, and um, they said something to me about, I don't know, they shared the percentage of their graduates who end up leading in the North American Jewish community. It was a really great number. I don't know, 30%, 40%. 44, whatever it was, I actually, while not necessarily the focus of the William Davidson Foundation, what I was most excited about in that number was that means they're training 60% of their graduates to be very literate, informed lay people who can contribute to Jewish life and not necessarily be professionals. And so I actually think there's room for us to better understand you know, I get, Stacy, when you say that your board has made the decision, investing is for those people to be leaders in the community. We might need as a field to better understand what, what it means to be a leader in the community who's, who's trained, but not necessarily professionally involved, right? And, and how are those people contributing to Jewish life? I, I, maybe you all know of, of studies around this. To me, it seems like there's room for us to better, better, you know, lean in there. Well, I'll say that that was actually one of the implications that the research team found in the what we called the preparing for entry part of the study, which I, Alex, I believe you called them fellow travelers. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. The idea, yeah. right, that, you know, people who, you know, are promising candidates who ultimately don't en enter the field of Jewish education are still, you know, um, you know, possibly, um, you know, assets um, and champions of Jewish education. Um, and, and what does it mean to, what would it look like to engage them in the, in the work um, in ways that can, we can contribute, uh, that they, they can contribute um, from their kind of intensive um, experiences. I did actually, if I can, if, can I put you on the spot for one second? Stacey, because one of the things that I really like about, um, you know, how we've been having these conversations with the Jewish Funders Network is the opportunity to ask the host to kind of uh, make visible a little bit their own thinking, both personally and maybe how you, you talk about it with colleagues uh, at, at the foundation. But if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about um, how you, um, as a user of research, um, Think about um, think about consuming like the career trajectory study when you look at a report. You know what are you reading for, um, and and how are you making sense of these findings um, in terms of your own projects and strategy for the foundation? Um, sure, um, and I mean I was going to just I'll, I'll share a couple of things. Um, with, in general, you know we we're looking for tools and insights to deepen our understanding of the field and inform our future plans. You know, what, what are we going to fund? What initiatives are we going to develop? Uh, what grantees um, are we going to um, partner with? Um, you know, one of the, I just want to maybe just highlight um, one thing from the map, one, one appendix from the Mapping the Marketplace, re, Mapping the Market re, uh, Report is that just that landscape of current programs? I mean, that's that's never been done. I just want to make sure everybody saw that, and um, we we've been finding that useful to have just a simple list of all of the programs that are out there and and their the different um, characteristics of each. Um, uh, in relation to the conversation we were just having, I wanted to share that something that we're we're working with Rosoff Consulting on is is how do we how do we keep track of the um, educators and leaders that are going through the professional development programs that that we're supporting um, you know right now we don't we don't have an idea of how many how many people go through those programs what they got out of it where the, where they land um, and I would love one day to be able to you know just know those numbers um, and also, you know, pie in the sky, uh, could we survey them once a year, once every other year and find out what are they doing in their career? Um, and um, 
you know, in the Jewish community, whether they land in the Jewish community and stay in the Jewish community, whether they land on a, on a, a board, a nonprofit board, um, or whether they've, they've moved out of the, out of the community altogether. I mean, that would be just, just really fascinating information to have. Um, something else that came from the findings um, that relates to, to Mark's question in the, in the comments is, I mean, we've, we found it so enlightening to think about educators across the, the sectors um, and to think about the needs of, in professional development and training, um, depending upon what kind of educator they are. We'd never really thought about that before. Um, we've been thinking a lot about different kinds of professional development in terms of the career stage. Um, we're thinking about what's our next What's our next move in the um, early career professional development? What's our next move in the um, mid-career professional development world? Um, we've been talking a lot about that. Um, and then I think I said before, um, we're looking very, very um, closely at um, early childhood educators um, and have been working with some of the other funders on this call and elsewhere. Um, to, to think about what does a deep dive in, into early career educators look like um, for us. And this research has given us um, just a knowledge base, you know, more, more nuanced insights um, and um, supported our intuitions that we had and shed light on things that we, we hadn't thought about. Um, so I hope that helps give a little peek into how we've used, used this research. Um, so I, I'd like to just, you know, we have about six more minutes. Is, if anybody has any, anything they would really wanna say or ask, um, I'd love to know, you know, I'd love to continue this conversation. I'm just gonna say that. And um, if there are people that you feel like should hear hear the, these findings or read these reports that that aren't currently have access to them now. Um, let's talk about that too, but um, could I just open it up to more questions or comments? Okay, uh, so thanks a lot. I've been on a, a few of these and it's always great to hear different sort of cuts at it. And I also wanna thank uh, Ariel for coming to visit our Prisma team and giving a sort of a more sort of nuanced day school cut of some of the, of some of the findings, which we really appreciated. Uh, and I wanna pick up on Manny and Alex will comment about sort of uh, the career trajectories and also thinking about how, how niche a lot of the, the pre-service training has become. And, you know, elevate that to a conversation of like, what's the, what does the career trajectory of a Jewish educator look like? And why would an investment or participation in an early, in a, in a early career training actually benefit them and help them sort of advance that career? Meaning that we see so many different roles that educators can play uh, over the course of their career. And that the training that one goes through, particularly through an education training is very specific, but at the same time can really set somebody up for success in any number of different areas. So can we elevate the profile of Jewish educators in North America using this data to, 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 to emphasize what we want to uh, see as the training that they might go through and to say to somebody, you can really be anything and with a with a degree in Jewish education, with with pre-service training in Jewish education. And it's going to set you up to be a great leader in a Jewish organization if you go that route, or it's going to set you up to be a great day school teacher. It's going to set you a great person in, in informal education. Uh, and to really be thinking about it as the sector broadly like you have through the course of the research, but really doing that big sweep of what the arc of, of the career trajectory of a Jewish educator would be and why that pre-service training could really benefit them and set them up for success. That's something that Adka's talked about also, the need to tell more positive stories about work, who Jewish educators are and working in the field of Jewish education. And again, this idea that there are some kind of campaigns or something that just raises people's understanding and awareness. And this, again, goes back to some of the findings in uh, preparing for entry, right? What, what um, the research team called people looking for a map is that people often have very limited ideas of what you might do and where you might work with a degree in Jewish education and what populations you might serve. And if we can expand people's thinking about that, you know, perhaps that's also one way to bring in more promising candidates. 
Mm -hmm. Something that we talked about with our team yesterday, even. I want to underscore a point you just made, Ariel, or you touched on, right? Which is, if we keep talking about like the end of the Jewish community and shrinking demographics and people aren't going to supplemental school and they're not going to private school, right? That would serve a chilling effect on people looking to go into the market, right? Like, what are my career prospects 20 years down the road if this is a shrinking marketplace? So I think whether it's true or not, and people can have different views on, on trends, but the more pessimistic pessimistic the narrative is, the more we need to understand that that's gonna serve a chilling effect. I'm really interested in this idea about the flexibility of the training and wondering if there's some way that um, we could incentivize people to, let's say that they start out in day school and then they decide that they really want to try out early childhood or something, that there's some way to in incentivize them without great cost to them um, to do a practicum and additional coursework that would give them the backbone and the knowledge and experience to be able then to dabble into that field, but they wouldn't have to do an entire new degree again. You know, it would be like some kind of, not like a CEU, you know, continuing education, but some kind of add on in a sense. I'm not sure if that exists, but I was just thinking about it. Uh, for those interested in that, what Shira is describing, I think that Zev Elef is thinking about that a little bit. Um, out of Gratz College, if anyone's uh, interested in uh, learning more, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to folks. Yeah, there's an interesting data point that uh, may be helpful here. Again, going back to the case of Pardes, because they have these two very different programs. They have their day school track and their informal track. And the statistics, I don't have them uh, precisely at my fingertips, but I remember quite clearly is that they a much higher proportion of the graduates of the informal track have remained career-wise in Jewish education than have the graduates of their day school track. And their assumption is that the program uh, offers a much broader preparation and enables you to move across venues at least, but within the field of informal Jewish education. Whereas the day school track is essentially preparing you for a role and if it turns out that role doesn't fit, then you're kind of, you know, it's all or nothing essentially. Yeah. Fascinating. All right, well, I feel like we could um, talk on and on, but we're gonna have to close. Um, and I'm gonna uh, turn it over to my colleague and now friend. We've been through a lot together and I can truly say we're friends. Um, Manny Manchel at the William Davidson Foundation to close this learning series, but I just want to again express my gratitude to everyone on this Zoom and uh, previous Zooms and especially to um, Ariel and, and Alex and Tamar. Um, so Manny, would you like to close us? Yeah, I, I just, I, I feel uh, uh, so, so uh, deeply and profoundly that sense of um, just joy and excitement and gratitude um, and also a, a real hope um, that this uh, three-part series uh, just is the start of what this group and many others can uh, do to invest in this important work. Um, for me, you know, I just, I guess I'll just offer a, a brief reflection that I wrote after the first part of the series, um, and I'm, I'll read it, but um, it is my hope and blessing that the investments of CASG and JFN and Rosoff Consulting, along with the Jim Joseph Foundation and William Davidson Foundation, can serve to motivate all of us and empower us a, a bit further in supporting, sustaining, and elevating Jewish educators. Um, no doubt our community is dependent on a well-developed workforce of mission-driven educators who are literate, skilled, and feel good about themselves and about their work. Um, and, uh, and in particular, may this investment be a merit for the souls of William Davids and Velvol Moshe Ben Rafael Vissara and Jim Joseph Shimon Ben Yosef. 
um, and uh, of course, in whose merit we all, we, this work was uh, really uh, meant to uh, advance Jewish life. Um, and a special thanks to uh, Ariel um, and to Alex and to Tamar, to each of you and your colleagues and teams for the countless hours that have gone into this work. Um, and of course, to you, Stacy, uh, my friend and colleague and partner, thank you to you and your team and your colleagues for everything you do for, for Jewish education and for Jewish life in America today. Thank you, Benny. Um, I don't even want to say much more after that because it was such a beautiful ending, but I just will also say on behalf of Jeff and a quick thank you again to Ariel and to Alex and to, to your colleagues and to Stacy and Manny who really led the charge in getting us to, to think about how we can bring this information to this community. And also Rachel, who's on the call today, also who hosted one of um, the three part series and more to come. There's so much information to dive into. It's always wonderful to also see this dynamic conversation and we're already in conversation to think about what could be next in, in learning more about Jewish education and how the funding community can be helpful. So thank you all, um, be well and, Hopefully we'll get to learn again together soon. Thank you. Thank you.